Welcome to the Naples Community Church Podcast with Pastor Kurt Anderson. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you find this sermon inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God moving in your life. We trust God has great things in store for you. Enjoy today's message. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, story of Lazarus. And um, as we looked at the text last week, it was from the 10th chapter. And because the denominational authorities in Jerusalem believed that Jesus was claiming to be God, which he was, they tried to kill him. So Jesus and the disciples left. They went down toward the Jordan River from Jerusalem. They went to the far side and, and there they, they hung out to, to await what to do next. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the 11th chapter of John. Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Martha and Mary. This is the Mary who later poured expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of Man will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. But the disciples objected, Rabbi. They said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world, but at night, there's danger of stumbling because they have no light. And he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go to and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even when he dies, yet will he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she said. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one, is to a, one who has come into the world. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. She had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within. And he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. 
Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, See how much he loved them. But some said, This man healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protected, protested, Lord, he's been in there for four days. The smell will be terrible. And Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you, you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven, said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Martha, Mary, and Jesus were identified as friends of Jesus. We all know Jesus had to have many friends because of the kind of loving man that he was. But these three in particular were those with whom Jesus stayed whenever he went to Jerusalem. He stayed with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So the four of them had to have a deep relationship with one another. And Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem, was easy access for Jesus to go to the temple whenever he was visiting Jerusalem. One time when Jesus was there, as is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Martha, who was so very meticulous about everything, so concerned with making sure everything was just so in the house, that the food was done just right, that the place settings were just so. I mean, not that any of us are any of this kind of person at all, but you know, Martha was meticulous, concerned about all of those operational details. Well, she complained to Jesus because Jesus was there and was teaching in the house. And Martha, pardon me, Mary was sitting next to him, listening to him. Martha came up and said, I don't think it's fair. Why should I have to do all the work and she's sitting here listening to you all this time? And Jesus reminded Martha, what she is doing is the necessary thing. What she is doing is all that is really needed. Well, personalities don't change. And so this time when, when Jesus comes again to Jerusalem and he's on his way back up to Bethany, he does so after this delay, finds out that Lazarus, this dear friend of his, has died. But he delays, he pauses, the messengers come to him, they tell him, and he waits for two more days. And then after two days, he goes up. And as he does, Thomas, who was one with a bit of an attitude, says, okay, we'll go. We'll go die with him. A little sarcasm to throw in. It wasn't until later in John that, that Thomas had his eyes open. But then he arrives in Bethany, Mary comes out, and in essence is scolding him. She goes out to meet him on his way. Says, well, Jesus, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. You're not being responsible, Jesus. This is your friend. And you didn't come when we expected you to come. Mary, for her part, stayed in the home and grieved. It, it points out 
something that I think we all need reminding of. And that is, yes, we do all of these instrumental things in life. We, we do all the things that we have to do. We do all of the, the stuff of daily life. And, and after a period of time, it can be, we can become obsessive about those things. And think that somehow life is not okay if we don't have this done. We've got to get up to Costco to get the tank filled. We've got, we're, we're out of orange juice. Some, you know, we've got to swing by Publix. We've got to do these things. We've got to get all these things done. And the reality is we can fill our days with all of these operational necessities. And then comes church on Sunday morning. And if all of our lives are full of those operational thoughts, we can sit in church and think about whether or not the roast in the oven is going to overcook. We can think about the neighbors that are coming over at 1 o'clock and if we're going to have the house ready. We can, we can fail to hear God speak. So this is why Jesus said to Mary, Mary has done that which is needful. Needful. Presumably that means the other stuff is good to do, nice to do, but not necessary to do. And if we are overly obsessed with the operational details of life, all of which gives us the illusion of control, we might miss something essential. And then we might become a little bit like Thomas, become a complainer. Become somebody who meets Jesus, meets matters of deep spiritual import with criticism or a critical spirit. We may not hear. So Jesus comes back with his disciples. And he knows what's happened. He knows what's going on. Nothing is beyond his perception in this whole situation. He meets Mary. And he assures Mary, assures her that, that Lazarus will rise. And then she responds theologically. Well, I know in the last day it'll happen. And how important it is for us to not respond to personal hardship, difficulty, particularly loss, with religious platitudes. She may have thought that Jesus was responding with a religious platitude when he was speaking directly to her and her situation. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, he's in a better place now. And... You know, we will all join him one day. Yes, that's all true. But Jesus is speaking to the rea reality and the depths of what she really is longing for. And what she's really longing for is reunion. That she be reunited. That this breach that has occurred in her heart and her life might be healed. The breach is within her, and she's longing for healing, and Jesus gives her the healing words that she needs. And she believes, Lord, I know you're the Son of God, I know you're the one, you are, you are the Messiah. She believes, but perhaps wonders, still. So why weren't you here, Jesus? Why did you wait? Why weren't you here? We live in that kind of world. We live in a world where we wonder why God acts the way he does. Why does God delay? Why isn't God there as we need him, when we need him? Why must God allow for time to pass 
and for suffering to increase. Martha was asking the deep and profound question that we all grapple with when we're encountering the realities of loss, of loss in life. Because we all ask why. And Jesus came into that very life, this life that is a why would God world life. Why would God do such and such a thing or not do such and such a thing? Then Mary comes out. Mary says the same thing. Obviously, Martha and Mary had been talking with one another. But I believe that Mary, when he, she asked the question, asked it in a very different manner. One in which she expressed her grief. And at that, Jesus, Mary is surrounded by all of the professional mourners. Those who weep and wail come around and may not genuinely care, but they come around because that is what they're supposed to do culturally. That's what they did. They came around and did all this weeping and wailing. And he saw all of this together. And he got mad. And then he wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. And Jesus wept. His promise is his presence. When Jesus makes this declaration, when he says to them, to Martha and to Mary and to all who are there gathered, when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he who lives and believes in me will never die. We don't know what that means. What we know is that in the place of death, Christ offers himself. In the place of loss, he is there. In the places where the breaches have occurred in our lives and where the most difficult forms of doubt and, and loss of hope enter in, he is there. Because he knows our life. He knows how fragile we are. So he offers his presence. And then we're going to go through this life and we're going to have hardships. But his message to us is in the final, in the final analysis, in the final moment, he will succeed. He will be victorious. He will bring life out of the reality of death. 2005, I went through prostate cancer surgery and came out of that and I thought, okay, I'm going to beat all the odds. I'm going to be tough. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm an athlete and all that sort of thing. So I pushed myself. On Thursday, I had the surgery. Sunday, of course, I was out, but the following Sunday, I was in the pulpit. Because I was going to show this lousy disease. I remember so well standing up over at First Presbyterian Church, standing there on the platform and almost fainting. And all kinds of other things that are attendant to having such a surgery. Fought it for the better part of two years. Fight it still. This body that our Lord knows, each of us, is fragile, begins to break down. Things happen. A woman in my church in California came to me. She had been through a double mastectomy. Came to me afterwards and she said, Pastor, I, I just, I don't know what's happening. 
She said, I used to worry about gaining two pounds. And now I'm just skin and bones. My body is all marked up. I got drain holes. I just don't know what's happening. I used to be so vibrant and alive. I used to run track. Now I can barely walk. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me and death will be conquered. Believe in me and you will not know the harshest realities of being, for, being forsaken in that moment of loss. Being left alone. I wonder. So when the stone rolled away and the the aromas of putrefaction poured out and people turned their head and when Lazarus came out pulling off the grave clothes and undoing the wrappings around his head. I wonder. I wonder if he thought he was in heaven. I wonder if he thought because he came forth out of the darkness into the light and he saw there Jesus. I wonder if he thought at that moment that, that was his resurrection. And the promise of Jesus is to all of us is that when we pass through that dark cavern, when the, storm, when the stone is rolled away and we emerge and we see that figure in the light, that's Jesus. That's our Lord welcoming us home. That is the that is the promise of the one who came to us, who gave all for us, sacrificed his life so that we might have life, life abundant and life everlasting. He is with us. And all of the stuff of this life that gets in the way, we just remember the things that are most important and focus on them. You bow with me in prayer. Lord, sometimes we, we wonder why you had to make us this way. <clears throat> Try as we might, diet, exercise, etc. We still find ourselves being very, very human. Lord, thank you that your son was very, very human. And he knows our condition. He knows our anxieties and our fears. And he brings all of this together in the moment of the giving of life. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your son, the resurrection. Amen. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a few things you can do. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. For more information, you can visit us online at www.naplescommunitychurch.org. If you happen to be visiting Naples, please drop in for our Sunday service at 10 a.m. We'd love to meet you. Thanks again for joining us. Have a fabulous day.